All right. And so without further ado, I think I'm going to go ahead and uh, get things started here with our special guest, Walter Marsis. Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate you taking the time to chat with us this evening. And for folks who do or don't know Walter, um, I mean, I honestly struggled with how to kind of start the introduction here a little bit. Um, Walter has been a I, I mean, I'll probably embarrass him, but I mean, he's a legend. He's a legend in these Chicago birding circles. He's been around for a really long time um, and is a mentor to many, has been a part of many conservation projects and initiatives over the years, a former president of Chicago Ornithological Society. Uh, but that's what this program is about here today. And that's what I'm excited to do is to get to know Walter a little bit more um, and hopefully uh, get some Cool stories along the way that maybe you haven't heard so far. So with that said, Walter, welcome. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you for asking me. So I guess the easy thing here to start with is just what was your spark bird? How did you get started in birding? Where did it start for you? I think if you really want to get down to the nitty gritty, my spark bird was dinosaurs. Because uh, like many uh, uh, school kids in kindergarten, first grade, and so forth, uh, very interested in Tyrannosaurus rex and Brontosaurus at the time, and all this, and a bit of an artist. So in first grade, uh, every one day there would be an art project, and everyone would be tapping me on the shoulder, well, oh, draw me a dinosaur, draw me a dinosaur. So that was the thing, and I got that from my dad. However, Around when I got to around third grade or so, I think something clicked in my head that I was never going to see a real dinosaur. And uh, what I, if I did, it would be a fossilized bones. And I just started seeing more and more images of birds and uh, uh, red-headed woodpeckers. And I remember seeing a, a documentary, a Walt Disney documentary, it had a great blue heron and a wood duck. And it was like, Damn, you know, that's something. And uh, my dad had some books. Uh, one was called uh, uh, Birds of America, not the Audubon one, but this was Forbush and a few other people, Fiertes drawings. And I would just pour over that. And then, you know, of course, then the chemistry started working and like, I should actually go out and try to find some of these birds. And I, I thought they were all, you know, extinct. Uh, but then I started looking in the Chicago and birds was a book at the, at the Field Museum. And it had bar graphs, uh, pretty similar to what they have in eBird now, of all the birds that can be found in the Chicago area. And I had it, that opened a, a door for to me because I had no idea that all these you know bay-breasted warblers and black hole warblers and black and white warblers and magnolia warblers that they were all here every year. You just got to know the right time to look. And so then I started doing that and. You know, the rest is history, as you say. So, so really, uh, I started birding alone and joined, I joined uh, COS when I was, I think, 24 back in 1976. So a lot of this was uh, on my own, just with my, at the time, the bird book was uh, Field Guide to the Birds by Roger Tory Peterson. And uh, one of, another book that he did that was really helpful, I thought, was a book called How to Know the Birds because it really distilled all the field marks and it really got me started. Uh, I, I didn't really um, uh, get into bird song much until probably when I joined COS and I realized how much I was missing. But, uh, but often what would happen is that uh, when I was, you know, nine, 10 years old, uh, we would go fishing, my dad and I and my brothers. And at some point I would put down the pole and I would go wandering off looking for Redheaded woodpeckers in Philadelphia vireos and stuff like that, and then it just went on from there. You know, so were you like kind of the that weird kid in the family where it was yeah. just like that's Walter, he's just doing his bird thing. Yeah, and I did actually go through a a uh, uh, you know a, a, you know again you're you're trying to figure out what what your thing is or whatever, and so I, I was interested in nature in general, and so we did a lot of collecting of. Uh, uh, you know, what do you call it, platythelment, you know, those flat worms where you slice their head and they have the gross two heads or, or, or uh, what do you call it, hydras, microscopic uh, 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 animals that you find in, in a, a drop of water. Uh, uh, butterfly collecting, I did some of that too as well, but, but eventually it just, you know, 
birds, birds is a thing, you know, and, and, and again, it's all interesting. I'm still, still interested in that stuff, but, but it's just birds, you know, just kind of, well, they're, they're so, they're just, they're basically in your face. You can't get away from birds. And so it's, it's kind of like, okay, I think I'll look at these. You know. Well, certainly we, we can, we can all appreciate, you know, the value of all the other creatures other than birds, uh, especially since most of them end up being food for birds in some kind, right? <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned kind of very much getting started basically alone. Um, I mean, you had your field guides, you know, Roger Tory Pearson, he's always there for us. But, you know, was there much of a community that you were plugging to, into at the time? Were there other kind of birders that you kind of found? Or was it mostly just you're kind of on the learning journey with you and your field guide? Yeah, I think uh, around, yeah, there was a period uh, of time when I, I started, I guess, uh, there was there was a local organization. I live in far southeast side of Chicago, had wish, and uh, so there was a suburban bird club which still exists and which you are very familiar with is Sand Ridge Audubon Society. So at that time, so when I was about 14 or so, 13, 14 years old, uh, they met at Thorn Ridge High School in Dalton. And uh, a couple times I got my father or another gentleman from the east side to give me a ride down there. So I got to touch bases with some birders that were my own age. And uh, they lived, I think, either Harvey, that area, the south suburbs. And so we, we started, you know, just uh, clicking. And uh, a lot of times they couldn't get me to leave the meeting. They said, come on, come on, the ride is leaving. And then I just want to talk. And uh, did go birding with them a couple of times and learned a lot from them. I mean, again, that's, you know, that's part of the, the, the the uh, joy of being in an organization is because you learn so much from other birders. And, uh, you know, I certainly learned a lot and I'm still certainly learning a lot. And it, it never, ever stops. Don't ever, don't delude yourself. Uh, so, so yeah, so, uh, the, you know, I, I remember one of them, the guy's name was Mike Neffer. Uh, his father, I remember, drove us to, we did a big day uh, in uh, May something of uh, whatever it was, 1967. And, uh, I think we got 70 species. We went to Palos, to Little White Schoolhouse. And I think I saw my first great egret and my first a lot of stuff, broadwing hawk, just all kinds of things, probably tufted titmouse. Uh, and, uh, but again, this part about when you uh, interact with other birders that uh, have kind of been to the same places that you have, and, and you just can't help but learn things from them. And so, uh, one thing was that, you know, they asked, have you ever seen a Lincoln Sparrow? And I said, uh, no, you know, I mean, how would you even know, you know, I mean, what is, what is, a, and, you know, Mike just basically took it apart for me that, you know, when you're, when they're watching the fall migration sparrows, you know, in September, or October, just look for a song sparrow, but it's really buffy and it has really, really fine pencil streaks on the breast and and it's just much more delicate looking than the songs for, and, uh, and, you know, so I started doing that and there they were, you know, and it's like, you know, well, how did I miss that? And so, so, you know, there's so much stuff you have to learn, you know, and, and again, connecting with other people helps that. It's funny that you should call out Lincoln specifically, because I definitely remember the first time that it clicked for me too. I was like, ah, that's yeah. what that is. Yeah, yeah. And that, that's part of the joy of birding, you know, uh, because it's the aha, you know, moments, you know, like, oh, that's what it is, you know, and, and that's, that's so much fun, you know. So you mentioned, so you mentioned going to kind of pay those areas, and I know a lot of folks who know you uh, probably mostly associate you with probably being a southeast side, kind of met area birder, um, but what are some of the other areas where you, you know, used to or still do frequent or just kind of favorite birding areas for you that you really Love to get so, to. I, I, at this point, I'm pretty much up uh, uh, here in the Calumet area. It's, again, I always use the excuse that uh, uh, when I walk up, well, first of all, you know, I should explain, I think that for me, birding is, is often uh, discovery of finding something, finding something on your own often, just, you know, uh, uh, ex having a hunch and exploring it, you know, and, and again, I'm basically where I live, I'm surrounded by, by really good habitat, you know, it was really great, got really bad, now it's really good again. And so there's a, there's all these places nearby that I wanna check first before I wanna go someplace more far flung. And so very often I just just go go to the local areas. And, and again, you know, you know, right now, you know, big marsh can't go wrong. Uh, uh, 
Edgar's Grove is a great birding spot. Uh, Calumet Park for the lakefront I go to. Uh, Hegwish Marsh, uh, great spot. Harbor's Eye Golf. There's just so many uh, local areas that are really, really good. And so, you know, I, I, I mainly concentrate on those. And, and, you know, again, I've got a, a long history in there. So, so it's, it's uh, interesting for me to compare years past with what's going on there now. And again, I, I should underscore that much of what's going on in the Calumet area now is favorable. Not everything, but but uh, certainly since 2015, since uh, uh, Audubon Great Lakes got involved in a big way, and uh, and and since proper wetland management techniques have come into play with uh, a, a huge helping hand from the Wetlands Initiative, uh, Gary Sullivan in, in, in particular. Uh, uh, you know, it's just, a, it, it's night and day. It's absolutely night and day. Uh, Big Marsh was essentially uh, before 2015, uh, say between two, uh, 10 years ago, let's just say, uh, uh, it was essentially a jungle of buckthorn, phragmites, and stagnant water filled with carp. And the birds were just so hard to find. And, and if they were even there, that's all changed now. All changed now. They've got water control mechanism so you can have mud flats just like we had this year for shoulders you can have uh, uh hemi marsh habitat for the, the uh marsh birds uh and then they, they're you know totally doing uh, uh, uh terrestrial upland improvements as well uh uh and uh, so it's just uh, it's a great place to go birding now i mean it's uh it's it's every everybody goes there you know every time i go there's, there's somebody I've, I've never met before is there you know so and it's fantastic. It's just a, this is a, a happy story. It's a happy ending. So I guess you really don't ever need to go anywhere. <laughs> You're in the right yeah, spot. Yeah. Just fall out of bed, you know, and then uh, oh look. Uh, but yeah, it's it's cool. It's a, it's a it's a for me. You know, some people say, "Why would you want to live from the southeast side of Chicago?" For me, it's like, why wouldn't you? But but you know, uh, to each his own. Okay, so let's uh, let's unpack something you said a few moments ago about how. It was good and then it got bad and then it's gotten better again so i mean obviously when you were younger living living in the area um it was a very different space and vibe and even though the, the southeast side has a long history of being industrialized there were still a lot of pockets that were good habitat yeah. you know can you describe a little bit like what that was even like and then when did it start kind of turning down when did it start taking yeah. a turn for the worse yeah uh to, you you had a very good introduction. And so, so as you said, uh, uh, industrialization for surely 50 to 100 years before uh, I started birding. And, uh, and so you were left with little pockets of habitat. And um, so uh, what I think was happening all along, although it was not, I didn't perceive it as such, uh, was a, a gradual, uh, degradation of habitat was occurring from day one, but I wasn't aware of it because I was so impressed by what I was seeing. Again, you know, the, where I started, uh, walking distance from my house is a place called Powderhorn Marsh, which is part of Powderhorn Lake Forest Preserve. And uh, at that time, it really was a um, kind of a microcosm of a uh, I'm a South Dakota hemi marsh or a North Dakota hemi. Yellow-headed blackbirds nesting, black terns nesting, Forster's terns nesting, common gallinules nesting, the rails, you know, Soros, Virginia rails nesting, American coots, uh, da 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 da. Plus, you know, grassland birds, sedrens, marsh wrens. Um, just, I had no idea what what blue winged tail. You know, I had no idea how valuable this, this space was until it was gone. And, you know, I took a sort of a hiatus from, from um, uh, birding for a while. When I was in my teens again, I was a victim of rock and roll. I, you know, became a <laughs> musician and, 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 you know, birds weren't cool. They weren't cool and, and I kind of, you know, but basically I think the rock and roll uh, 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 took me away from it. And when I came back, everything had changed. Uh, I, I believe there were some, uh, Processes going on at Powderhorn where the, where the marsh was dredged, et cetera. But what happened is all the, oh, I didn't even mention least bitterns, but they were just, uh, I, I would say, calm. Every, basically, you'd flush several 
uh, at any trip there. And uh, uh, so that all changed. You know, the, uh, in the 70s, basically the black turns were just hanging on and uh, the foresters turns were long gone. And, and uh, uh, the, you know, again, the yellow-headed blackwoods were, were uh, 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 losing their stronghold. Some of the other places they were at were Hegwish Marsh and uh, 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 Eggers uh, Marsh. And uh, so over the years, you know, things like, you know, let's say problems with water levels. If you, if you know anything about marsh birds, hemi marsh, uh, it, it's, a, it's a dynamic system. It depends a lot on water level. It has to be has to be shallow water, six inches to maybe three feet deep. It has to have a certain mix of vegetation. It has to be emergent vegetation with with openings in it. When you get a, a lot of parcels of wetland like we have in the Calumet area that are uh, segregated from one another, that are isolated, little say postage stamps wetlands, all of the natural hydraulic cycles are interrupted, railroad tracks interrupting them, roads interrupting them. There's, there's no flow between the various marshes. And what happens is uh, you get a, and this happens in, in marshes and urban areas really everywhere as a matter of course, it's just a matter of time that what you start ending up with is there's no dynam dynamism. They just become stagnant ponds. And especially with the invasive and uh, invasive species like Phragmites, weeds, purple loosestrife and so forth. And so what was happening over the years, and I remember in the, uh, the 90s, uh, you know, purple loosestrife was everywhere. It's not anymore, it's been sure. But now, uh, you know, Phragmites is the, the boogeyman and, and it is a boogeyman because it's so self-serving and, and it basically uh, uh, excludes all other species, which is not a good thing. I mean, you don't want to just have one species. You want sure, it's just, a, it's just a bully. It comes in and just drives everything out. It's a bully, yeah. and, it's, and it's not the case and it's, and it's natural where it's naturally evolved like uh, uh, Egypt or, or where have you, where you actually have birds that evolved with it and they nest and weed. It's different here. It's just a bull, like you said. So, so, uh, so this was all happening incrementally. And then, you know, I remember there was a point, I think in the 80s, where I was like, just like, where are all the black terns? They were, I was so, um, I just, I couldn't understand why they had disappeared because uh, it was, uh, they were really, I mean, if I said that they were everywhere, when I was 10 years old, I wouldn't be kidding. They were nesting uh, throughout the Calumet area. And so the last pair, I think, uh, nested in like 1986 at Big Marsh, and then they just dropped off. And so I was very interested, and I started contacting IDNR for reasons for this. And so I never got a really good answer, but I mean, they definitely mentioned the things like, like invasives and so forth. So as time progressed, uh, uh, more of these species, uh, started sort of dropping off the map. Uh, you know, certainly uh, Jim Landing and the 19, um, Dr. Landing from uh, University of uh, Illinois Chicago did a lot of studies down here on the shorebirds and on the marsh birds. And that kind of got my attention. Uh, and, uh, you know, he would do counts of the of yellow-headed blackbirds nesting and so forth. And so, so I started, you know, eventually I got in touch with them and became a member of the Lake Calumet Study Committee. And uh, uh, basically, you know, over time though, uh, it was such an exciting area in the, in the 1980s and lots of rare short, curlew sandpiper and sharp-tailed sandpiper and just all these crazy rare species showing up. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, again, you know, but underlying all this it was there's this, uh, kind of in the background, this spooky thing that, that just that we're losing this, we're losing more and more birds. And so, you know, I don't know if you were you on the birding scene when yellow-headed, you were probably were still around when, when yellow-headed blackbirds were breeding in the Calumet area, Edward? Or did you miss <laughs> Maybe, I, I, don't, I don't know. Maybe I was around, but I wasn't aware of them. Yeah, because 2013 is pretty much when they fell off the map. So that's already, you know, that's a long time ago. Uh, so, so well, ten years ago. So so uh, uh, you know. So this is this is all happening. And then really, by the time we got to say uh, 2012, about to ten years ago, um, it got bad. It got really bad. I mean, and it, it got bad to the point where you know, it just uh, every everything was gone in, in a nutshell. Uh, okay. You know, and so. Uh, so at that point, I was approached by, uh, I know there was a field trip I was leading with 
with uh, Judy Palak, who is with uh, uh, at that time, I think, uh, Ottawa and Chicago region. And so she was just quizzing me about, you know, what's going on at time and how are things down here? And I said, you know, basically, uh, sucks, you know, it's awful. <laughs> Not it's, great. Uh, and, I mean, I'm sure that's, that was the words I used, you know. And uh, so she did come up with an idea. Would you like to put this uh, on paper? And I said, sure, you know, and so she got some, some uh, uh, funding from the IDNR and, uh, and uh, Judy and I, I basically wrote it, Judy did the summaries and, and cleaned it up a bit and so forth. It's, so it's uh, Marxist and Pollock and it came out 2013. It was the, the Calumet area IBA and it was a sort of a, just a 10 year, no 20 year history of the uh, state listed species and uh, uh, important bird area species. Uh, so, so we went through the whole gamut of you know the black carnivorans, yellow carnivorans, we spit all of the state listed listed birds. And of course, black carnivorans was a major one there because there was uh, hundreds of pairs nesting there in the 80s and 90s, and that was already declining. And it really they basically stopped nesting in the Calumet area around uh, 2010, 2011. And so that was uh, right in time for my document. And so. So basically I had written out this entire history and, and uh, I don't know if that was the only uh, uh, document that called this pe to people's attention, but people started knocking on my door after that. And uh, I, you know, I did a program at Wild Things. It was called uh, Lake Kelly Met What Happened, just outlining uh, all the declines that had happened there and the reason why. And, uh, and, and believe me, I did know much of the reason why it was simply because habitat degrad degradation. And I, uh, uh, again, I'm talking about hemi marsh because a lot of these species, gallinules, leaf bitterns, coots, um, uh, pipe milk grapes, so forth, rails, uh, they rely on a certain structure of, of marsh structure. And that just didn't exist anymore in the Calumet area than it had previously. And so, uh, so you know, I, I had people's ears, and so I gave programs, and uh, and uh, especially uh, Audubon, Great Lakes, Nat Miller, Stephanie Bilkey came into the picture, and um, and my gosh, uh, we just uh, researched the living hell out of it. I've uh, got the Wetlands Initiative involved, and all of the partnerships with all of the um, uh, agencies, Forest Preserve District, um, uh, IDNR. Um, uh, uh, Chicago Park District now with all, all of their wonderful land holdings. And you know, much of this I was skeptical at first because I, I've kind of been hearing this all my life that, you know, yeah, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do this, and then there's a political change and nothing happens. But especially the park district, I thought, what in the world would the park district know about, about uh, natural areas management? But my God, they've done a fantastic job. They, they you know, in areas like Eckridge Marsh and uh, and big marsh, they just turned them around. They really have, and uh, and you know, kudos to them because uh, again, it, it went from a great area to to just essentially nothing much there to to back to being a great area again. And so, so you know, you know, uh, kudos to all those people, you know, and and really everybody who was involved. We had a lot of people involved, and I learned so much again from people like uh, Gary Sullivan from the Wetlands Initiative. I mean. Uh, he just made my head spin with the stuff that I learned from him. Good stuff, good stuff, you know. And, and, and it's all, it's, it's all complete. I mean, I mean, some of the ideas are simple, you know, just about about water level management, that it's fluting in faces, keeping the right uh, structure, vegetative structure. I mean, that's, that's fairly simple. It's not always easy to do, but it's a fairly simple concept. But there's, it's so much more complex than that, because, you know, as you alluded to, uh, it, it, everything's all connected with the food chain. Yeah. You've got your, you've got your insects. You've got your other invertebrates. Uh, you've got your the whole plant community is so important that we amphibians rely on it. The fish rely on it. But then the birds rely on. You know, it just goes on. And everything's connected, and it's it, it's so it's a big complex web. And you know, again, that would point getting back to a bird like the black tern. I'm not exactly certain what happened with that species because it was so abundant. But I think that, that out of all of the, um, the marsh birds in our area, they actually do have a rather 
uh, high standards that they, they adhere to. I think uh, they, they like to have multiple wetlands so that they can move from place to place, so, which we kind of do have here, but, but also that things like they're sensitive to winds uh, because they're nesting on the surface of the water. Uh, other things, I, I have to believe since they are uh, primarily, I think, feed on insects, and we know that insects are not what they used to be because there's so many pesticides and, and whatnot. Now, I, I'm not sure exactly how that feeds into the puzzle, but I suspect it has uh, something to do. I mean, you know, you don't, you don't see hatchings of, uh, you know, some areas that got the, what is it, the mayflies, uh, where there's just thousands and thousands, two feet deep. But, you know, I mean, the, the, we don't see that kind of stuff around anymore. And people comment on the, uh, the uh, uh, they're not seeing as many bugs dying on their windshield. <laughs> yeah, the, the windshield effect. So again, I don't have the answer on black turn, but it is a stark example of how quickly things can change. Again, from a bird being common to an abundant and really literally in every wetland to now being a sun, basically no wetlands. I, I don't even see them in migration anymore. Some people do, I don't see them on the leaf, but sure. it's, it's a little spooky, it's a little spooky. So, and Edward, I warned you once I start talking, <laughs> I will not shut up and- uh, Well, no, I mean, <laughs> these, are, these are amazing it. things that, I mean, my God, we could, we could probably spend hours unpacking all of this, but I think it's just, it's interesting, you know, I, especially today, when you look at some place like Indian Ridge or Big Marsh or Hegwish, which have undergone that restoration you talked about, I mean, it's easy to forget that that's a new thing. That's, yeah. that, that, that has not always been that way. It hasn't even been that way for a decent amount of time. It's really just in the last few years that progress has really been made and started to show dividends. Yeah. And, then, and you know, you touched on a, on a, a valuable point that uh, I think I do this and probably many people do, I can't speak for everyone, but I think when I first witness an area, habitat, what have you, uh, my, I guess my body is telling me it's always been this way, you know? And uh, no, it has not always been this way. Uh, it, it's it's always changing. You know, it's always changing. And so, if you if again, if you look at just some of these these uh, habitats in the Calumet area, and again, I've been doing bird in this area for you know fifty five years or, or more, and so I've seen these changes, you know, firsthand. So when I was a boy, ten years old, I it was cattails typha. It was the wetland plant, and I assume this was maybe the broadleaf, uh, native broadleaf uh, cattail latifolia. Uh, uh, I can't vouch for that, but that was the plant that wetland birds were nesting, just cattails. And then, uh, you know, I remember seeing like in the early 1970s, these beautiful purple flowers, and um, oh, I would no. read, yeah, and I would read, people would say, <laughs> Watch out for that purple loose draft. We must remove the purple loose draft. I'm thinking, what's the problem? What's, you know, what, what could be wrong with that? It's just a pretty little flower. And then a few years later, all there was was purple loose draft. You know, Hedwish Marsh was a big acres and acres and acres of purple loose draft. Indian Ridge was all purple. If you parked at 122nd in the railroad tracks, it's just a huge field of purple. Uh, and it's basically gone now. I, I know a bunch of effort was gone in the early 2000s. I know they did the Galaricea beetles. I'm pronouncing it wrong, Gal Galaricea beetle beetles. Uh, and I know they also did the herbiciding and other, other uh, controls, but the beetles, I, I know that was a big, big project. And, and they really did turn that around. All the different agencies, Chicago Department of Environment, was involved in that. And uh, I know they even got school groups involved and, and they really turned that around. There's still purple loose draft for, around for sure, but not, it's not a monoculture of purple loose draft. Of course, once for they sure. got rid of the purple loose draft, you know what happened was then the, the bully of all time, the Fred Mighties uh, took over every square inch of, of the Calumet marshes. And so, so those were three big changes from Typha to, uh, to the purple loose draft to Fred Mighties, and now we are, I guess, I guess in the age of uh, combating Fred Mighties or something. And so, so you know, again, when one of the things that was done at Big Marsh, uh, uh, this was uh, 
Oh, it had to be, uh, I think 2011, they started doing most of the terrestrial work, but, but I think it wasn't until like 2015 or so that they actually herbicided um, the, you know, extensive Phragmites and all, uh, did their first drawdown and they did not know what would come back. Uh, what to explain when you want to plants, wetland plants to germinate, uh, it's generally necessary to do a drawdown because the plants germinate in very shallow water or just mud. They don't, for instance, a cattail uh, or, 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 or a bulrush will not germinate in three foot deep water. It's gotta be a very shallow, it's kind of a mud flat type of a habit. So, which is, so okay. if you want plants, wetland plants to germinate, you do a drawdown. And so they did that and, and it was just, uh, it was almost like magic because I think the expectation on everyone's mind was that they had gotten rid of most of the Phragmites, but they thought probably what's going to come back is going to be all Phragmites, but that wasn't true at all. It was a lot of the plants that, that uh, came back were, were uh, a seed bank that was, had been sitting there for 20 years, and it was bulrush, and it was cattail kypha, and then, of course, Phragmites as well, and they still have to uh, keep tweaking it every few years. I mean, the, the Phragmites isn't going anywhere. It's you get rid of it and it comes back in a couple of years it, it, because it's, you know, what, if you have a, a parcel of land like Big Marsh or Hegwish Marsh, uh, uh, you, let's say you got rid of every single Phragmites stem and every root and every runner and uh, 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 it's completely surrounded by areas of Phragmites. So it just, it just takes- yeah, All you gotta do is cross stony. Yeah, and so a, a puff of wind blows some seeds, or a little yeah, the little uh, runners go across stony, and they and it like they could move concrete even. They're so strong. So so yeah, it, it comes back. And so so I don't know what the ultimate answer is. That I think right now the what's happening is that we are treating each of these preserves as as kind of a natural garden, and maybe that's all we can do right now because the threats uh, to 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 them. Are, are so strong from, from the outside. But, but if that's what you gotta do, that's what you gotta do because you want to maintain some of this natural uh, native integrity and um, uh, that won't happen. If you look, you know, again, that, I know it's been tried many times where uh, a contract would be done to restore a, 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 a marsh. There's many examples in the Calumet area. And so it's, it's a maybe three, four year project where, where they remove all the exotics and they, they plant uh, natives, et cetera. And it's, and it's absolutely fantastic for a year or two. And then, you know, after three years, the fragment is coming. Right. So you can't, that's, that's, that's not even, well, it's worth doing for a year, but it's not worth the money you've put into it unless you have a forward going, um, you know, sort of management plan uh, in perpetuity, you know. And, and yeah, you, uh, consistency is key. Yeah, yeah. So, so, and you know, and that's how that's how we're learning. And you know, again, the Calumet area is, is an exciting area. I'm sure that the biologists will tell you because it's uh, a lot of this stuff is new ground. I mean, literally, because we we have this uh, uh, environment where you know, so the, the a lot of the the substrate that you're walking on is uh, industrial slag. And so, what do you do with that? I mean, how do you make that work? And you know, there's some analogies that have been made to Dolomite prairies and stuff. You know, and, and so I mean, it's kind of exciting. There's there's things that make, but I think you know the, the what my focus has always been is kind of the the the, the wetlands that are in between. You know, these uh, uh, the the dredge spoils in between the uh, uh, slag dumping and also because because the wetlands. Um, uh, Again, if they were maintained in a certain way, and as long as they're clean enough, and I think I think most of them actually the water quality is clean because you know again wetlands as part of their job is cleansing the environment, and so so you know uh, in fact I just had attended another Zoom conference a couple of days ago about a project at Wolf Lake, which is in the Calumet area, which is not a hemi marsh, it's a deep lake, and they're doing a a, 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 a this is a shed aquarium and. Uh, and I believe, um, well, Shedek Burger for sure. Uh, oh, and Illinois Natural History Survey. And they're doing a public awareness, awareness campaign on mud puppies. Uh, yeah. and mud puppies are actually quite common in, in Wolf Lake. I, I had no idea. I've lived here you know, all my life. And I knew that they're around when I was a kid. And so 
again, that kind of attests to, I mean, they, especially in amphibian, uh, uh, you know, amphibians are extremely sensitive to uh, chemical toxins in the water because they absorb through their skin. And so if uh, mud puppies are doing well in there, it, it probably means that the water is probably is pretty good. Uh, and so, uh, so that's kind of an exciting thing. And, and, and again, you know, it's just another branch, you know, all the stuff is interrelated. I'm sure that I'm sure that great blue herons are happy that there are mud puppies there because they, you know, <laughs> big blue, I'm sure you know. they're thrilled. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great blue herons like to eat big things. I don't know if the mud puppies are even big enough for them. Uh, yeah, I'm, I mean, they'll shove anything down their gullet. They can shove down there, right? <laughs> yeah. So I don't, yeah, I don't know if they'll eat an Asian carp. That's too big, I think. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't know. Maybe they'll evolve to get to that point, and that'll be the solution that we've been looking for all this time. Yeah. Um, I want to. I, I I have a million other questions, but I want to get to at least one other thing here before we open it to audience questions. So I want to shift gears a little bit um, to just specifically on Chicago Ornithological. I mean, your you you your marker is all over this organization. I mean, from our current logo, which you drew, to the Chicago Birder magazine, uh, which if you guys are not a member, you should be because it's really awesome. You're the one who started that. Um, you know, obviously you were a former president and involved the COS in many aspects. And so I guess I'm just curious, you know, looking at where, you know, COS and just, I guess the birding community in general is at now compared to kind of where you were when you were president and doing the work that you were doing for COS. I mean, how does that compare? What was it like? Okay, uh, good question. Uh, yeah, I already warned you about this, but I have to show my exhibit A is that since we're talking about the Chicago bird. So here is the um, original, original artwork of the COS woodcock. And, there it is. Uh, so that's it's India awesome. poster board. And now it's all over your website and everything. There were there wasn't a such thing as a website when I did that. And and here is the uh, premier first issue of the Chicago Birder newsletter. Looks very, very different. And of course, we didn't, there was were no websites then. So this was mailed to people. Uh, you know what? I will tell you that's a great question because I would tell you that birding organizations, uh, probably every organization, are a lot like Habitat in that they are constantly evolving. And um, nice, and, love that analogy. And that is uh, what it is doing now in a in a, a very positive way, and that's what it was doing uh, when I was president. That uh, uh, there's always, you know, whether it's every decade or whatever, there's there's always some sort of a profound change. Uh, uh, when I joined uh, a lot of the, uh, you know, again, I was looking for something at that point in my life and, and uh, especially as an outlet for, for all the bird stuff that I was, I was starting to get back into again. And, uh, and I, I, the way I found out, well, I had already was aware that there was an organization called COS uh, because I had uh, that old, uh, booklet, uh, Chicago Land Birds, and I, you know, mentioned the Chicago Ornithological Society and various people. Uh, so that was like 1958 was when that book came out. So this is, I was birding at Eggers Grove in, um, in um, uh, say, 1976, it would have to be. Uh, and uh, I recall, uh, I was just birding on my own, and I bumped into a field trip. And I believe that the person who was probably the membership chair at the time, so some things never change, you know, uh, I think it was Frances Carter, if, I, if I'm right, but she gave me some information and said, you know, we're Chicago Ornithological Society and you may want to check out our meetings sometimes. And uh, so, you know, I thought it over. I don't know if I even went in, the, in the, that year, but I, but I, uh, uh, maybe the next year I went, and my God, um, uh, I didn't know a soul there, and I didn't know what <laughs> to say, and no one knew me, and uh, I recall the uh, the president was uh, Grace Smith, who uh, was actually a relative of a, a friend of mine who I had actually met some time before and talked a little bit about birds, uh, and the field chair was Doug Anderson, 
And uh, anyway, so I was just chat, shy as can be and stuttering. And, you know, they asked for your sightings. What have you seen? And da 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 da. And um, you would never, you know, listen to me now. Boy, you probably wish I was a little shy. But, uh, <laughs> but, but uh, you know, it was a good thing to get my feet wet, you know. And uh, so by the time, you know, again, this, this group of this organization was evolving. Before you know, I got really involved. With, they had basically would be they would mail out, I, whether it was every month or every two months, I don't recall. But it was just a, an eight and a half, eleven sheet of paper, which uh, you know would say what the upcoming program and, and field trip was. So that was what I entered into. Now, when I after a period of time, I had been there quite a while. Eventually, I became field trip chairman in the early eighties. And uh, uh, kind of like what, kind of like you were not only president, but you were kind of field trip chair too, Edward. Now because I see, I, I don't know how many field trips do you lead a, a year about? Like that, that's not important. That's well, not important. well, it was it was like that too. You know, I was basically leading all these trips, and so uh, eventually, you know, it came around time. Uh, you know, the president stepped down, stepped down, and, and so forth. And so this was so 1989, and so I was. Fine, you know, sure, I would like to be president, got nominated, got elected. And what happened though was that the again the club was changing. A lot of the membership, I think, was from Hyde Park, basically, um, and uh, a lot of them were older, uh, elderly, and I was uh, you know 24 years old or whatever. So the membership kind of dropped off. I think I think they weren't really ready for that for this big change, and so I was basically kind of left with a club without much of a membership. So then what you do is you brainstorm and say, well, this is a good organization, but we, we got to get it moving. So, you know, we, we just um, uh, uh, publicized it any, any way, shape or form. I did a lot of publicity through Sandridge uh, Audubon Society and it got people from that organization to come on our trips and uh, through Chicago Audubon Society and uh, did a fantastic article of a tour we did with David Willard from the Field Museum of the Back Rooms and um, got all kinds of people to come and they all attended the meeting and before long, we had a full club. West Seraphin was one of the people who joined then. Uh, just a, a lot of people, and, but it was almost a complete turnover. Then we had to reinvent the newsletter. And as I said, it had been just a, a sheet of paper, uh, eight and a half, 11 paper. And so, uh, but I really, I wasn't comfortable with being president and this and that, and I wasn't gonna be the editor. Finally, Alan Welby, who now lives in Connecticut, uh, he stepped forth and said he would edit the newsletter. And we got a assistant editor called, named Christine Keel. Uh, and again, you know, looking at this, you know, this, it looks like it's kind of a mimeograph thing. That was like when typesetting, you know, let's say the home typesetting was in its infancy. And so I, I believe the program that was out then was called, uh, I think it was an Adobe program called Adobe uh, Ventura. And it, right. have you ever heard of that? Because it, it, no, it, it I don't was, know, maybe other people call it The but. instruction booklet was like the Bible or like a telephone book. It was like 500 or a thousand pages. And, and I remember Alan Welby just throwing his, his hands like, I can't do this. And so thank God Christine Keel could. And so, so we put it together, you know, we just, we, we put our, you know, our souls into it, you know, our hearts and souls. And, and, uh, and we got a, an organization going. And, and it was beautiful, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, again, after the years, you know, the, the president, okay, Wes Serafin was the president after me, and uh, lo and behold, when, when he was president, uh, a, a bolt out of the blue came that we were bequeathed uh, an inheritance from a lady named uh, Catherine McQuarrie, they called her Cappy McQuarrie, who passed away. And she left fifteen thousand dollars to the Chicago Ornithological Society, and we did not have we did not have any bylaws or a constitution, or so we had to hire. Or well, Wes did. I I didn't. Uh, uh, thank God it was I, past my time. But Wes had to hire a lawyer, and um, and I think Jeff Williamson was involved in you know writing up the bylaws and this and that. And so we, you know, it became something 
pretty that was just a that was a real shocker you know but it just went legit yeah it just goes to show you know what what happens and um so i, I know after wes uh, one of the presidents was mike kutska uh who he was just a what he would do was uh was he would have uh, a cos table at the flower and garden show i believe it's at navy pier and uh he just got so many new members. He got so many, many uh, following presidents came from that. Uh, Sigrid Schmidt comes to mind. Uh, and he just got so many new members. And, and again, you know, uh, COS is just a, uh, a flourishing organization. That started to change after a while. And I think uh, 2020 hindsight, you could say a lot of that maybe changed because of the thing called the internet. Because uh, now, rather than going to a meeting in person where you discussed your sightings, all of this was done electronically now, you know, via, you name it, whether it's email or phone trees or whatever. And so I think that that started to fall off. And then I know, uh, I think maybe when Jill Nyland was president, Sigrid Schmidt, uh, maybe um, um, uh, Randy Decker started to change, people weren't coming to the meetings. And so again, you uh, you adapt and you evolve, and they did. They uh, they instead of having we basically had monthly meetings. I think at every time every month from September through May, and they changed that to a, I guess one a annual meeting or two annual meetings. And everything was starting to perk up more electronically, and that was the right decision for the time. And it continues to today. And you know, my goodness, you know what you guys got now going now. It's you know with, with the uh, the the, the 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 electronic newsletter coming out and it's gorgeous you know i mean you know the idea of having color photography it it was impo in two words impossible back then and uh now it's it's just uh mainstream you know i mean it's basically mainstream you know you've got beautiful four color photos uh throughout the the the, the, the thing you've got involvement from so many people and um and you know look at this you've got you know just talking to me and you got all these people signed up so so it's, it's wonderful and you know and again just that you can i didn't even have to leave my kitchen you know i'm and i'm talking to all these people you know in, in person you want to talk about impossible you know having this whole thing through a webcam and this program called zoom <laughs> Really, I mean, it's it, it's it, yeah. It, you know, I always say we're living in the future, and for me, we are for for sure. It's uh, it's in so many ways, you know. So yeah. You know, so I mean, it, that that's that's uh, I don't know. That that's might be might be bad in some ways because we have pandemics and things. Too. Nah, we're, we're just gonna <laughs> ignore that part. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, the, no. the modern treacheries of uh, modern we have a lot of good stuff. We have uh, we have drones. You know? <laughs> there you go. There you go. Well, drones are cool. You know, you can take pictures of stuff. I want to try to. Uh, we, we've been at this, you and I, for a while. I want to throw this over to some of the folks who joined us here today, get some of their questions in here. Okay, yeah. Uh, uh, how, is we only have five minutes left? or? Well, how, how long can you stick around? I'm, I'm okay. Uh, but we'll be here all night then. Um, but I do want to see, I got a question here from Maureen. Um, well, two. At least her first question, she was asking if that Calumet IBA is available anywhere. And I know it's out there. I don't know if it's like publicly available, but we can find it, that. And it was, I'm not sure, I know it, I know it was, I, th I think it was on the BCN website, and it was, but I don't think it is anymore. I think they may have pulled it. I, I certainly have a, uh, is there, okay, like if I were to, I, I have a, a PDF of the final document, if I were to email it to you, would you be able to? Well, yeah, yeah you no, know. you can just send it to me, I and I can, I can certainly send it to everybody that. who attended here today. Yeah, um, absolutely. That, yeah. But Maureen, you had a second question. Would you like to just go ahead and unmute and ask that? Yeah, sure. Thanks, um, and thank you so much, Walter. It was so interesting to hear about your your whole journey. And one of the things that really caught my attention was when you were talking about how um you know the incredible work that's been done when like the different public groups and private groups you know come together around particular parcels of land and i like i watch that and i think that's amazing and sometimes i wonder like 
is there something that gets lost if there isn't kind of like a guiding group that keeps everything coordinated? Because it it seems like it could become really fragmented if it's not sort of. So I don't know. I'm I'm kind of new to this area. My work in health and human services tells me this is what happens, but maybe it's different in conservation. I don't no, know. I, I, no, I think you're absolutely correct. And, and if my perceptions are correct on this, I kind of would, would uh, say that Audubon Great Lakes was the umbrella organization that, uh, that got all of these other, uh, you know, say, you know, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, IDNR, Forest Preserve District, Cook County, uh, the uh, park, Chicago Park to, to sit down at the same table with, and, and they also got the Wetlands Initiative involved. And I think the Wetlands Initiative was the, uh, I, I, how do I put it? It's just that they were, uh, they had the professional guidance that was needed and they had just a record to stand on that shows that they are really state of the art in wetland management. But I think it was Audubon Great Lakes that really knocked on everybody's doors and you know they basically had connections with all these groups, but got them to partner and actually sit down together and say, this is what we're, we, we know, you know, again, again, this isn't, the, in this case, it was with well, marsh birds, but uh, it's been done. I know that there's been movements to save grassland birds and, and uh, other, other avian groups. Uh, but in this case, I think it would become abundantly clear that uh, not just in the Chicago area, but in, in throughout the North America that uh, marsh birds were in huge trouble. And uh, so it was time, I think, uh, I mean, I, I would have liked to have seen it happen a, a lot earlier than that, but it didn't. And, but, but at that point, it was, uh, there was enough uh, uh, of a reason to focus on this. And, and again, Audubon Great Lakes, I think were, were the, uh, the, the group that was instrumental in bringing all the other groups into a partnership. And yes, yeah, so I think you're absolutely correct. Cool, thank you. That was super helpful. We got another one here from uh, Kathy Garnis. You wanna unmute and ask your question? Sure, for thank you. Continue to go ahead and just put your questions in the chat and we'll call on you. Um, sure, actually I have a different question. Can I ask this question? It seems much more interesting. Oh, sure, go ahead. Um, I'm really curious about the outcomes of the ongoing relationships between birders and the uh, rest, restoration volunteers who are more interested in the plants and the habitat. It's always seemed to me that those were two separate communities that for the very longest time, until you actually warned Edward, kind of got, got, got people connected, that they weren't talking to each other very much, you and Jeff Scrutiny. And so now I'm, I'm curious what Walter has to say about the long-term, um, effects that he's seeing or if there are you know improvements overall in the habitats because the birders in the um the, the plant folks so to speak are, are talking to each other now or what yeah uh you've touched on a, a, a very important point as well and uh again i think that that was in the case of the calumet area in the case of the the Mar calumet marshes that's that's i think why uh why uh, Audubon Great Lakes involvement was so important because uh, my role basically was as a birder who had knowledge of the history of the area and the, what birds were there. However, uh, I am not the wetlands initiative. So, you know, again, that's why you needed a, a, a group with expertise that is, that is reliable. You know, I can give anecdote, anecdotal information of us. What happens so often with marsh birds is that the uh, floristic people who are doing the uh, the uh, floristic restoration, you know, the number one, well, there's three public enemy number, well, number one, two, and three. Phragmites for the wetlands is, a, is public enemy number one. We all agree on that. Typha, cattails is also public enemy number two or three 
and of course buckthorn, which is a public enemy. Now, the, 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 the rub often happens with typha, with cattails, because birders know that the marsh birds want Typha. That's it is it's the structure of cattails is it's a what's referred to as a tall, robust, emergent. It's strong, it's 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 really I it's what a gallinule is looking for, or a leaf spitter. And it's, in the Chicago area, when they want to build their nest, that's what they're looking for. Something with that structure. So the problem is the floristic people are absolutely correct in, in pointing out that typha is extremely invasive, especially in 2022, uh, because it is no longer the typha that existed 100 years ago. It is a hybrid swarm, which is far more invasive. And most of the typha or cattails that we have in the area is it. So what I'm, I've been totally used to my whole life is that when you talk to the floristic people, yeah, we got rid of all the cattails. Isn't that great? And I'd be like, my, I did get a knot in my stomach. And, and uh, but then when you try to explain it, they say, oh, no, 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 I was always taught that typha is, you know, we get rid of it. And they're right because it is invasive. And the, the you know, some of the, the main problems with, with typha is that if you have it in shallow water, it'll eventually uh, outcompete everything other than Phragmites. And it'll, all the broadleaf emergence, all the other native emergence will, will kind of fall to the web side. And it's still happening. It's a, however, the thing is it can be controlled to some extent. With water level, deep water, uh, if you keep it uh, segregated to the deeper water, uh, that that's a way of controlling it. And uh, and and again, if it's if it gets to the point where it's excluding other species, just get rid of it. You know, I mean, because it, again, it's very aggressive. It's a, so. But again, there there was no real meeting of the minds. And uh, you know, this happened with I know just uh, restorations. Um, uh, in uh, say, I remember the one back in the 90s, Cherry Hill Woods, uh, this was a grassland restoration. They removed all the shrubs and the birders went crazy because this was yellow-breasted chat habitat and blue and warbler. Habitat. What I would say is that nowadays, at least in the Calumet region, uh, when I talk to land managers, uh, you know, the people with the Chicago Park District and uh, Forest Preserve District, I've worked with a, a lot of them, Dan Spencer, um, um, uh, Stephen Bell, uh, uh, Lauren Umek, uh, uh, Alex Lopke. Uh, now they don't have to be re-educated. They get what's going on. They know that even though typha is an invasive problem, they know that it is also extremely important to to marsh birds. And so they they just have to balance that. They have to, you know. Keep in mind that that it can get out of hand, but be, be ready for it. And actually, at Hebrish Marsh, since we have a drought this fall, I don't know what's going to happen this this uh, this winter because uh, this is the type of conditions where plants germinate, and so it may become a monoculture of, of cattails. But I, I've already talked with Alex Lopke about that, so uh, that he better be ready for it. But I mean, you don't want it to be a you know. Cattails are valuable for marsh birds, but we don't want it to be a 100% monoculture because that's not of any value at all. So I, I, I mean, am I kind of answering your question? Because what I'm saying is I think that the more that the, uh, the, the different, the birders and the, uh, then the floristic people talk to each other, uh, the more that this comes out. But I, again, in, in the case of Calumet, I think it was the involvement of, of Audubon Great Lakes that really made the difference because we had professional agencies that we were able to dig up information that that proved pro both sides of the equation, and so it wasn't just an anecdotal thing where oh no 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 don't take don't get rid of that plant or yes we have to give it. It was more of a thing where we actually had uh, evidence and, and you know documentation for this is uh, why cattails are good. This is why they're bad. And again, that's just one species, but it was so uh, so critical for the area. Did did that kind of uh, answer your question? Sure. So I guess my takeaway is that we have to keep an eye on the cattails, uh, totally get rid of the Phragmites and reed canary grass as we, as we can. Yeah. Um, and and I, I'm, I'm steward at Hosa Park. And so what I've been trying to do is like keep some st shrub st structure, but get rid of like the fruiting female buckthorn. Yeah, yeah. And, and so, again, you know, if you get rid of every single buckthorn bush on the I want to say on the planet, uh, if there was just one seed left, 
it would be 100,000 acres of buckthorn again. You know, you don't have to worry about it bouncing back, you know. But again, the, you want to have more uh, tender, loving care for the native shrubs, you know. And, and, and again, you know, that I'm, I'm often quizzed by uh, land managers and forest manager districts about things like shrubby willows, uh, which are native. But I think that they also, uh, you know, if you have a, say, a, a grassland with, with uh, little islands of shrubby willows, you know, uh, they, they're concerned that these are going to get out of hand and we won't have a grassland anymore. And they have a point, but I will always caution them that this is very important habitat for willow flycatcher, you know. And uh, we've got a lot of willow flycatchers in the, in the Calumet area, and that's why, because we have these things with potentially invasive sandbar willows and blue willows and pussy willows. And uh, so, you know, again, Dan, Dan Spencer is the dude at uh, Powderhorn very often. And, you know, he listens to me and I listen to him and, and it's, it's, it's a balance. And same thing with, uh, with buttonbush, you know, a buttonbush is a native plant, beautiful plant, and uh, it can choke out um, swales and so forth. And so again, it's, it's in these days, you really have to be knowledgeable and you have to maintain a balance and it has to be, uh, you know, an educated uh, balance because uh, uh, it could go in any direction at any time. And you, you want to, again, it, it's, it's no longer really a, 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 a system that, an ecosystem that is just going to perpetuate itself. It's, it's going to change radically in a few years because of uh, the situation we're in now with the, the industry and the, the lack of hydrolog hydrological connections and the separation of parcels and so So yeah, you, you really want to keep an eye on everything. You want to maintain it in a way that's, that's uh, you know, uh, if you what you think is best uh, uh, for the whole community. You know? and, and that means not just the birds, but it means the floristic uh, uh, portions and the amphibians and insect life and so forth and so So yeah, I mean, really the communication is very important, I think, yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's like, I don't think that's, there's ever a simple way to approach that, right? But I mean, that communication you said is key, right? Is being able to yeah. keep your door open, talk with those other parties, and then actively seek them out. Like you said, it sounds like, you know, for example, Audubon did, where it's like, they could have gone out alone, or they will, could go out and knock on those doors, as you said, and get all those parties to the table. And, and things, uh, often even putting your best foot forward, uh, uh, Things just don't go the way you want them to, or at least they don't for a long time. And it's just mother nature, you know, maybe uh, maybe you want a low, lower water level. So you lower, you have your mechanism in there and you lower the water level. And then it rains every day for three months. And so then the water is six feet deep and say, why aren't you managing this? Well, we are managing it, but we're just, you know, we're just a part of the equation, you know? Uh, Mother Nature is, uh, shall we say, like the biggest part of the equation. You know, we're just uh, tinkering with, you know, with that. And so, so yeah, it, you know, it's never perfect ever. You know, and it's just, it's just you want to want to try to, you know, maintain some, maintain some kind of a balance. You know, and uh, Mother Nature and, always has the final say. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, if you got more questions, I'll answer. But if, if, if yeah, do you have any other questions? All right, I have one last silly question though, which is all of that, all of that work and data that went into that Calumet IBA, this is before eBird. So were you just like combing through years and years of notes? Like how yeah, did that well, work? Well, actually, uh, let me stop. It, it, technically it was not uh, before eBird. Cause this was published in, okay. The, the data is from 1993 to 2012. And I think Ebert started around 2002 or 03, uh, early 2000s. I didn't really get involved till a few years later, but but so part of it. Well, but but no, I'm a I'm a nut, basically. I mean, that's the best way to express it. I I'm obsessive uh, in many ways, as are many of us. I think in our own crazy <laughs> that's, way. That's that's just the birder trait, right? We're all a little bit I, unscrewed. I think you hit the nail on the head. And so, uh, but but I'm exceptionally so. I think and so so you know there was when things again having 
been placed in at this location, you know, born into this location, Southeast Chicago, and then realizing the treasures that it holds and then seeing how they were changing over time. I was just, they had a compulsion to, to write it all down. And that's what I did. And, and basically, uh, you know, there were the, the things that are, uh, things like Metal Ark that was, uh, that started in the nineties. And before that was, there was North American birds. And so I would send a seasonal report to the compilers of that. And so I would uh, have good details and I kept it. I, I, I kept it, I didn't throw it away. Or uh, Computers were, were, were when, I, when did I get my first computer? I don't know, the nineties, early nineties, but of course I lost all my data, but, but I kept paper. I kept what they call hard copies. So, so yeah, I had it all written down. And so I was able to just transfer it into a, um, uh, you know, the, the form of this document. And um, yeah, that's, but that's, I, I, uh, I think writing things down has a lot of value. And in, in fact, that's, you know, how it was done decades ago. I mean, when I was coming up, uh, the, uh, the mantra was always, I mean, I mean, believe me, cameras were not what they are today. Cameras are so good today that, you know, you can get really, really diagnostic uh, photos uh, if you have a, a good rig. Uh, but back in the day, they were not. And so the mantra was always, take good notes and so you know i still do that and, and that's why people always see me with my little scratch pad uh because i just think it's very important you know just to, and especially since uh, uh the other mantra was that um that you know uh do it right away because you as the hours pass you lose uh the moment you know and so so that's a and that's still true you know but of course you've got a camera uh often cameras will show you things that you had no idea we're even there now. So yeah, so uh, I still think it's important, but cameras are, are just amazing today. On that note, uh, we're, we're well over our hour here and I didn't see any other questions rolling in here. So I think I'll go ahead and um, wrap things up here. And first things first say once again, thank you, Walter, for taking the time and sharing with us this evening. Um, I know I really appreciated just getting to pick your brain. It, sounds, it seems like from the comments, everybody else really appreciated that too. So thank you, thank you, thank you for taking the time this evening. Virtual applause here. Um, additionally, for folks, uh, you know, obviously this has been another episode of Birds and Bites, Chicago Ornithological Society. So um, if you're not already a member, why the heck not? Uh, it's a fantastic organization with a very long legacy of some incredible people and some incredible work. Um, and Obviously we have no interest in stopping. Uh, our work in the Calumet area specifically continues to this day doing as much as we can to support the natural areas and burning in those areas. Um, and then additionally, yeah, you know, it's the new wave of how we're doing things. We've got more and more virtual programs coming down the pipe here, uh, both, you know, patch chat programs, which feature specific burning areas or birds and bites programs like this, where we put uh, experts uh, in the hot seat to learn from them. So check out our website, uh, if you haven't already, chicagoberta.org, consider becoming a member, and hopefully we'll see you guys on the next program. And with that said, have a great evening, everybody. Uh, enjoy the rest of your week, coming weekend, and uh, this amazingly fall-like weather, and go get some birds. Thank you.